Hi there, Matt Easton, Scholar Gladiatore, and I am reviewing another one of Todd's fantastic products. This time, a rondel dagger again. This rondel dagger is, well, will be very familiar to many of you who pour over Arms and Armour books or who visit the Wallace Collection. Quite simply because it is based on one of the most famous surviving medieval rondel daggers um, in the world. It's appeared in lots of lo lots and lots of books. And um, if I just remove it from its scabbard for a second, you will, if you're not recognised it yet, you probably need to buy more Arms and Armour books. <laughs> um, but it is not an exact replica, I think uh, Todd said to me, but um, it is pretty damn close. It's like the cousin of the one in the Wallace collection. Now this is a pretty damned special thing. First of all, you can see it's got a whopping great blade on it. Let's just get the uh, friendly little tape measure out here um, and see how long this beast is. Um, so it's 15 inches in blade, uh, which is 37 and a half centimetres. That is pretty damn big. That's, that's bigger than your normal ruler, school ruler. Um, and But you know what? It's not heavy. And the reason is because it's got a very aggressive and notable hollow grind on it. But what's interesting is the hollow grind isn't uh, continuous to the edge. It actually goes like this and then has a reinforced edge. So it's a bit like a fuller. Okay, if we just look at the uh, thickness of the back of that blade for a second, it is near enough to a centimetre, I'd say it's about 0.95 of a centimetre, so nine and a half millimetres um, thick at the base of the blade, so it's really, really thick at the spine, which of course, as we've mentioned before, gives a colossal amount of rigidity, um, which is exactly what you want from a rondel dagger, of course, but this one has cutting capacity as well, and I have to say, whilst rondel daggers aren't meant to be used like this, if you gave someone a good uh, a good hard sw sw <laughs> swipe with, with this, it would probably chop quite far into someone's um, forearm, for example. It's it's not it's not going to cut as well as a bowie knife but it's not that far off um partly by virtue of its length of course the heft because of its size it's actually got a fair amount of cutting capacity to it where rondel daggers fall down uh, some of the time i think in in terms of this example as well in terms of cutting capacity is the grips the hilts aren't really set up for that um, they're really designed for generating a lot of force in either a point down or a point up stab and this has got some pretty noticeable big rondels there, hasn't it? So I think the date, let's see if this is written. Um, yeah, I think, so Todd's put a fairly broad uh, date range on this from 1400 to 1470. And I think that's fair enough because actually, whilst this is a very impressive and very big rondel dagger, it's also relatively generic in that there were rondel daggers like this shown in art and surviving that seem to span quite a broad period of time across the 15th century. And in fact, I might even push it back a little bit, a little bit earlier into the, the last decade of the, of the 14th century onwards, uh, right the way up to the 16th century, I think, you can find similar uh, rondel daggers to this. So what have we got here? What have we got as, as the package? Well, first of all, we've got that whopping great 15 inch blade. It's hollow ground, okay? It's got a functional edge on it that you could chop with or draw cut or slice push cut with. Um, and interestingly, it, this is more or less a design feature. It doesn't make a lot of difference, but that little scooped out um, bit at the back there, it highlights the fact that the back edge is a raised, um, a raised sort of wedge section. Now that's very, very interesting because I happen to have read certain things about bayonets used in World War One, and they had problems with certain designs of bayonets getting stuck in people. And what they found is the blade is less likely to get stuck in someone if you have an angular back rather than a rounded back. A rounded back seems to create too much friction, particularly with bone, and the blade is more likely to get stuck in the person you're stabbing. So it's interesting that lots of rondel daggers have this feature, this raised wedge back, um, rather than just being rounded or flat. And I think that's probably to do with blade extraction. I think it means that the blades are less likely to get stuck in stuff. Also, if you're punching through something like plate, um, which isn't generally advisable, but it might it might happen by accident. Um, stabbing through plate, it's more likely to part the metal if you've got an angle, as we know from certain types of arrowhead and crossbow bolt head, it's more likely to part the metal than if you've got a round or flat surface which will kind of get stuck in the metal. So all sorts of reasons why that raised back wedge section is common on rondel daggers and it's accentuated by the design feature here. 
Looking at the um, hilt, I will stick it in its scabbard to make it a bit easier to show you the hilt. So there we go, let's hold that up. Hopefully that's all clear to you. So you can see, what we have here is a concealed tang. Todd explained this to me. Initially I thought this was the tang we could see, but then I realized this is brass brass both sides and of course the tang is steel because the blade's steel and it's peened through at the end there. So what we've got is a concealed tang that goes up the middle and then much like on many uh, bowie knives or bowie knives depending which you prefer, um, we have a concealing brass strip front and back that covers the front and back of the tang and in this case it's got these incised lines again very much part of the medieval aesthetic just to if there's a plain surface why not do some kind of hatching or cross hatching or lines or indents or dots or something on it to make it more interesting and more saleable. I guess you know back in the day in the 15th century if they were making these by the dozen then they'd probably decorate each one slightly differently knowing them when they've got them in their shop or on their stool that you know different people have different tastes and everyone likes to be a little bit different from the next person and uh, one person will go oh I really love that dagger with the dots on it and the other person will go oh well, I prefer the one with the lines on it and this is the one that they bought. Um, the um, wooden scales, if we want to call them that, grip scales on either side. Looking at them, I think, are boxwood, um, which is a light coloured, it's almost kind of ash or pine coloured, light coloured wood, but it's got a nicer grain to it. And boxwood's very popular on medieval knife um, handles and dagger handles. It's a very nice wood. Um, I've, I love boxwood, actually. I, I choose it myself on, on things I've had made for me. Um, now, one of the most interesting things about this dagger, which you can go and see the original of in the Wallace collection, I highly recommend you do. Um, so one of the most recognisable things, first of all, about it are these little brass um, decorative elements in the middle there on each side. And um, they do actually conceal or contain a rivet. So that the grip scales, we've got a hidden tang in here, and the grip scales are held on by one, two, three, pins or rivets that go right the way through and are then essentially peened uh, either side that compress everything together like a sandwich. And the central rivet has this little brass decorative element on and that is a particularly memorable feature to the Wallace Collection Rondel Dagger uh, which you will recognise from many books as I mentioned. Uh, but one of the most notable things about this Rondel Dagger and the original in the Wallace Collection is the size of these discs. And not only the size, but the construction. This comes back to something I've said in previous videos, that very often original rondels on rondel daggers are not made of a solid piece of metal. They're made of sheet metal, um, either in a sandwich construction with an organic material in the middle, such as wood or horn or ivory or whatever, or they're made essentially like a box, a hollow box or hollow cylinder. And the way this is made is if we have, I'll try and get close up so it will focus, there we go. So essentially we've got a, like a little buckler, okay, we've got like a UFO flying saucer there and another one underneath. And round the edge, I don't know if you'll be able to see the light, but you can see a slightly gold line where it's brazed. Now brazing is one of the ways that throughout history, even until modern times, and even in modern times, some people stick one piece of iron or steel to another piece of iron or steel. And essentially you hatch the surface, you melt some brass, or bronze, usually brass, copper alloy, and you, you stick them together. Essentially you're using the, the brass as a glue. That's a very simplistic way of explaining it, but it works for most people, it works for me. Um, I'm a simplistic kind of person. So essentially those two steel discs, or iron discs, um, if you imagine them like this, are stuck together with brass around the edge. Completely solid once they're stuck, but the advantage is it means those discs are hollow. It means they're not solid. They're still incredibly strong and it's still relatively thick steel, but it means there is an air cavity inside there which reduces the weight of the weapon. It means you can have a nice, large, fat, aesthetic disc, which they obviously liked for a number of reasons, it's quicker to pull a dagger out if you've got a rondel at the back. And of course, if you're stabbing someone repeatedly, it's better to have a nice big flat surface area for the force of your hand to go against. So you can have a nice big smooth rondel that is, doesn't weigh as much as a solid one would. So there we go, another one of, oh, and just a very quick look at the end of the, um, 
the end piece of the scabbard there. The scabbards, as always, inner leather, outer leather, relatively stiff, nicely stitched up the back so the stitching is not visible, and then uh, metal fitting just at one end in this case. Um, and you know, another fantastic piece of Todd's manufacturing um, and a really, really iconic rondel dagger. And I suspect I might know someone who wants to buy this, but we'll see if they get there first. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon, or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.